Welcome to Woodbury Writes Podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Carlson, and I'm here today with Dr. Willie Steele, a professor of English at Lipscomb University in Tennessee and editor of Nine, a journal of baseball history and culture. Willie is also co-director of the Nine Spring Training Conference. Formerly a cross-country and track coach, uh, Willie was featured in the Fox Sports documentary, If You Build It, 30 Years of Field of Dreams. He is working on a book about baseball in the aftermath of 9-11 in Portland, Oregon. His works include A Member of the Local Nine, Baseball and Identity in the Works of W.P. Kinsella, Going the Distance, The Life and Works of W.P. Kinsella. Thank you, Willie, for joining me this afternoon to talk to us about your passion for baseball and writing. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate you having me on. So would you just tell us more about you as a writer and, and your passion for writing about baseball? You know, a lot of writers have this wonderful story about the moment they knew they wanted to be a writer, and and I wish I had that type of story. Um, but the writing in baseball for me really goes back to uh, the summer of um, 1989. Field of Dreams had come out that summer, that spring rather, and there was also the latest installment of the Indiana Jones films. I think it was Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, the one with Sean Connery. And there was a whole group of us. We were going out to um, to see a movie. I don't. There were six or eight of us, and everybody wanted to go see the Indiana Jones movie. But I had seen this preview for a guy who plows under his cornfield and builds a baseball field. I grew up in Ohio, where we're surrounded by cornfields, and so I kind of liked that idea. And so everybody else went across the theater to to see Indiana Jones. And I sat there by myself watching um, Field of Dreams. I was 16 years old. You know, when the when the movie came on, I've watched it countless times since then. And it says, based on a novel by W.P. Kinsella. I, I remember very clearly watching the movie, but to be honest, um, Sandy, I don't remember when I first read the book. It was after the movie, but I don't know when. Fast forward a few years, and I was doing my master's thesis at Middle Tennessee State, and um, I needed to pick a topic. And so I thought, well, if I could write about something like baseball or Mark Twain or the Civil War, which are my three favorite things to to research and, and read about. Um, so I, I pitched this idea, uh, pardon the pun, of doing fathers and sons and the relationships you know, in that dynamic in uh, the movie Field of Dreams and the novel on which the film was based, Shoeless Joe. Uh, and I thought I was finished, Kinsella. Fast forward a few more years and I had to pick out a dissertation topic when I was at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And so I thought, well, let's see if they let me do something baseball related again. And so that time I uh, looked at the the ways in which Kinsella used baseball as a way of establishing various types of identity in his baseball novels. I finished that one and thought, okay, now I'm officially finished with Kinsella. My dissertation director wanted me to get this thing published. And so fast forward a few more years and I blew the dust off the manuscript and sent it off to McFarland Books in North Carolina and they published it. Now I'm officially finished with Kinsella. Except there's a guy in Canada who got that book and loaned it to Kinsella. And, I, and a little side note, Kinsella said he was an atheist, an actual card-carrying uh, atheist. I've seen the membership card in the archives in Canada. Um, and I was teaching at a, at a faith-based university, a Christian university. He hated academia. He said that the five years he spent teaching were the longest decade of his life. Um, and oh, then boy. he also said he hated literary theorists. And my degree is in literary theory. It's in literary criticism. And so I've got nothing in, in common with Kinsella. Kinsella reached out to me in an email and said uh, something along the lines of, I just read your book. You didn't screw this up too badly. You didn't jump to absurd conclusions like so many academics tend to do. And that's a line that later on I asked him if I could use for a blurb on a, on a, on a future book. And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I thanked him. I said, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out. Now I'm officially done with Kinsella, uh, except two weeks later, it was around Thanksgiving of, of 2012, he emailed me and asked me if I wanted to do his biography. And I had never done a biography. Well, I take that back. I did a biography of my grandmother in seventh grade, but I made up about 80% of it. And so it's about, it's more fiction than his biography. And so that started this uh, about six years, six and a half year process of going to interview him spending, oh, I don't know how many hours on the phone with him, 
reading through hundreds and, and hundreds and hundreds of, of pages and boxes of manuscripts and notes and letters. And then the biography came out uh, in, in 2019. You hear people sometimes, Sandy, say, you know, well, you need to do something productive rather than going to the movies. Thankfully, going to the movies that day in 1989 turned out to be pretty productive for me. Sounds like it, it was the beginning uh, of your, your career, right? Getting laid out. Yeah, but I, but I didn't know that. The, you know, there, there's a line in, uh, in Kinsella's novel, Shoeless Joe, where the Moonlight Graham character that, you know, uh, Burt Lancaster plays in the, in right. the movie. He says, uh, hardly anybody recognizes the most significant moments of their lives while they're happening. And that is, I mean, and I've told Kinsella that, you know, that that's that's me. I didn't know that when I was 16, going to the movies was literally going to map out a lot of my professional career, but here we are. It worked out pretty well. <laughs> well, it's it's terrific that each time you had to do a, a, a major writing assignment that it, that you pursued your passion, that you were, yeah. you know, things were taking you there. And it's terrific that you had uh, thesis advisors who were going the road with you. Yeah, yeah. And and for that I am grateful. I mean they they were wonderful. And and I've also learned to quit saying that I'm finished writing about Kinsella cuz I <laughs> I I don't think I'll ever be finished, Sandy. Well, I have a question for you. While you were going through all his uh, memorabilia, his notes and things, did you discover that you guys have anything in common besides your love for baseball? Yeah, we have a disdain for committee meetings, academic meetings on a campus. We have my, my favorite piece of advice he gave me is find out what room you're going to be in and wear a shirt that matches the wall color so you can blend in and they never call on you. That's awesome. So, yeah, we you know we we obviously have a passion for baseball. We shared a passion for uh, good literature. He would I've got in my office on campus about forty years of his personal diaries, and in the ends of the, at the backs of each one, he would write the books that he read every year and he would rank them. He would, you know, oh, this is a, a B minus or an A plus. And then he started doing the same thing for movies. And it was interesting, you know, I, I always like as a writer talking with other writers about what they read. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think you can be a good writer without being a good reader first. So I, I would spend far too much time looking at the backs of those diaries to see what books he was reading. Um, and we would oftentimes kind of compare notes. So, you know, what are you reading now? What do you, you know, what movies have you seen? And so even though we, we didn't agree on things like, you know, religion or teaching or um, literary criticism, there were some things that there was enough that we had in common to make the relationship uh, uh, doable. And as an outsider to sports, I, I mentioned to you in an earlier conversation, I know baseball through literature and I mentioned right. two Actually, three, of course, The Old Man in the Sea and Santiago's um, idolizing of Joe DiMaggio. Yep. The alleged rigging of the 1919 World Series as that appears in The Great Gatsby. And, of course, the, um, the fateful Little League game when Owen Meany beans his best friend's mom and she dies and there it goes. <laughs> you yep. know, so this, yep. this, this is the extent of my experience of, of baseball. But as, as an observer, I just... It is a connective tissue among people who love the game. Yes. And and on a, a side note, kind of funny, we have new neighbors and they're big time sports people. And <laughs> the wife told me I'd have better social skills if I could learn sports. <laughs> 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 and I can't argue with that. Um, <laughs> but I, I but it's an interesting insight. I mean, what do you suppose it is about baseball that that it is this sort of connective tissue that runs through people who love the game? Well, that's a great question. And, and you know, even people like you who who say, well, I don't know much about sports, but every time I've heard that, after the but comes something that they know about sports, right. even though it may seem to you very trivial. I, I had a conversation while I was working on my master's thesis with a guy. Um, I was flipping pizzas at a pizza place, you know, to, to pay tuition. And this guy asked me what I was working on. And I told him, he said, I don't know anything about baseball. I couldn't tell you the difference between Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. I said, but you do know something about baseball because you chose these two iconic players who were often compared against it. So you know something. Well, yeah, but, you know, and so I, I think to your question, you know, what makes it this connective thread? I think for for baseball in particular, it's it's an American game. 
you know, it's uh, it's something that I mean, surely, you know, came from games like rounders and town ball and things like that. Um, but but it's it's a game that in the uh, in the 19th century really developed in America, spread after the civil during and after the Civil War as a you know example like the the prison camps. People would learn the game and then take it back home. It's unique in that sense, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and one of the things that Kinsella always said that it connects with people is you could you could drop somebody off in the 1860s. And even though the rules have changed a little bit and the equipment has changed, you could tell this is a baseball game. And so it's something that it's something that really is, is, is timeless in that sense. I think as far as literature goes, there's so much great writing with baseball. You know, Bernard Malamud's uh, 1952 novel, um, um, The Natural. There's, you know, all of the Ring Lardner books. Um, I've actually got a got a copy of a book that I ran across the other day. It's from 1910, uh, Letters from a Baseball Fan to His Son. And it's it's remarkable. You can, it's, it's, this could have been written, you know, last month. And so I think that there's something about this sense of ownership that we have with baseball. But But it's with sports in general, I think it's one of those things that, and, and you're a perfect example. You know, I, I don't know a lot about baseball except for, and then you mentioned three examples of baseball, right? Uh, you know, or of sports. And so, um, you know, when I when I moved from Pennsylvania back out to Oregon, and people say, "Where are you from?" Well, we just moved from Pennsylvania. Well, are you a Steelers fan? You know, and there are these assumptions mm -hmm. that are kind of built in. You know, if you're from New England, well, you must be a Patriots fan. You know, right, right. Um, and, and so it's, if nothing else, it's just sort of a, a cornerstone for conversation and, and identity um, that I think is kind of an interesting, uh, th there's a whole bunch of interesting cultural studies that are done on that sort of thing, but it's just fun. It should be fun. And I, I suppose listening to you, Willie, I'm thinking of those family picnic backyard wiffle ball games. All you need to do is be able to run in a square, <laughs> in a diamond. Yeah. And I, I think... I think to to speak from the I don't know anything but camp. I think what's always marvelous to me is that people who are, know their game and can cite statistics from way way back and remember specific games. That is uh, for me. It, it's humbling that that sports fans can hold on to that information with such clarity over time. It's remarkable. Yeah, and and what's what's funny is um, you know, and and again, so much of my. So many of my examples come from Kinsella because I've been immersed in it for so long. He said, if you give me a couple pieces of flora, a couple pieces of fauna, and a couple of street names, I can make you think I've lived anywhere. And, you know, he said, I, I can look up in the baseball encyclopedia. You know, the, the Moonlight Graham character is a perfect example. His in-laws had given him um, a huge, it's a, they used to print it every year, the baseball encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. And it was anybody who ever played any in one inning of a major league baseball game, you were going to be in there. And he was leafing through that and came across um, Moonlight Graham, this player who had played for one inning, never got an at bat. And he thought, boy, it's got to there's got to be a great story there. And then he's got this excellent nickname, right? Moonlight. And so he started doing a little bit of digging and went to Chisholm, Minnesota. He said, you know, I, I'm not a baseball expert. I can look up all of the facts. But I, I like the I like the pace of it. It's very casual. It's very leisurely. You know, it goes on in, indefinitely. You can have a game. He in his second novel, um, the Iowa Baseball Confederacy, he has a game go for 40 days and 40 nights in a flood, oh, okay. which steals from the book of Genesis. Um, and he says, um, you know, he says a game can go on forever, theoretically. And he said the great thing about baseball is there's no limit to how far somebody can hit a ball or how far somebody can run to catch a ball. And so I think that there's elements like that, but you don't have to be the person who can list every single player who's ever played for the New York Yankees to be a fan. You can you can be a fan without being that person. And I, I think I'm I'm one of those people who has a few statistics memorized, you know, just because they're, you know, they're kind of the big statistics. But I just like going and, you know, I'll, I'll go watch a, a Little League game just because. Um, mm -hmm. There's just something about the game that's very, very comforting, really. I've, I've seen the games in our, our town park and, you know, you've got the, the, the kids and their dugouts and all that and families just gathered around and it, maybe it's the last chance for, for families to just kind of sit in the sunshine yeah. and not worry about stuff because baseball takes time. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. and it's not the rat race of a basketball game and sitting on the edge of your, your bleacher. But it, I think everything you're saying really does speak to how it is an yeah. essential fiber in the fabric of our of our culture. Well, and until recently with, you know, the pitch clock and all of this, um, and I could spend days going off about why I think the commissioner is awful. Baseball is the game where you're not constantly watching a clock. You're not limited by, you know, okay, a, a you know, football field is a hundred yards by the, there's, there's every stadium is a little bit different. You know, they're, they're laid out differently. There's, you're not controlled by time. You know, again, you know, used to be, you could go and a game could go on for 50 innings if it needed to, but um, now we've kind of changed the rules a little bit, but that, that um, I, I like the idea, you know, people complain about the pace of the game. I, I'm okay with it. Let a game be four hours. I don't mind sitting out in the sunshine for four hours and baseball le lends itself to great conversation. You know, you're sitting with somebody and hey, did you see that? What do you think about this? And then in between innings, like, so what are you guys doing next week? You know, and you, you just have, it's a great game for conversation. Um, and I don't think you get that with, with hockey or basketball or football or, or any of the faster paced games like that. So it, I mean, it preserves that, that social element of why you, why you go to a sporting event anyway, you know? Yeah. 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 And I'm thinking of the Kevin Costner character seeing the players on the field and and being a part of that that history and and seeing history through those players. Could I could I just ask you uh in your research did you find that the movie is is true to the book and as James Earl Jones's speech is that um is that from the book or is that part of the script? We just get okay. that from Yeah, so um People often ask Kinsella what he thought of it. You know, Kinsella said, I never wanted to be part of the screenwriting process um, because I don't work well with others. Um, he was very, he was, he was, I know, if you know anything about Kinsella, read anything for more than about 10 minutes, you realize he was kind of a lone wolf. But he said, when the script was sent to me, uh, well, when when um, Phil Alden Robinson was going to write the script, he he sent Kinsella a letter and kind of explained, you know, I, I want to do the book justice, but some things are going to have to be changed because we can't fit it all into a hour and 45 minutes, two hour movie. And Kinsella was living in Hawaii that winter and he sent a postcard back and he said, uh, Phil, do what you have to do to make the movie Love Bill. As as Robinson, Phil Robinson was writing the script. He, he kept in touch with Kinsella and said, here's some changes we're going to have to make. Um, it does stay in a lot of ways, word for word with, with the book. Now the book, and, and what's funny is, um, you know, since we're on Zoom right now, I can show you, I've got Kinsella's version of the script, oh, nice. um, which is really kind of cool. And then over on my other shelf, I've got the original version that was changed. And so I've gone through and kind of I, you know, the, the literary theater, like, okay, what'd they cut? What'd they change? Why did they make that change? There, there's an entire character who plays a significant role in the, in the uh, book who's cut out of the movie because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't include it and have it be under two hours. In the film, the Terrence Mann character that's so wonderfully played by James Earl Jones, in the book, it's J.D. Salinger. He kidnaps Salinger. Oh, in wow. fact, the, the working title for the book uh, for a while was called The Kidnapping of J.D. Salinger. Yeah. And so what's funny, though, is, uh, Sandy, is Sal when the movie, uh, when the book came out, um, Salinger's lawyers sent a letter threatening to sue. Oh, and they were going to sue for libel. And Kinsella basically said, let him because, you know, to prove libel, you know, did you portray him in a defaming light? And Salinger in the book is a wonderful character. He's a very warm, kind hearted, older, older man. And so if, you know, Kinsella said, if you want to tell people that you're just this crotchety old guy who doesn't like people, then okay, yeah, I portrayed you in a bad light. But, and so they, they backed off that lawsuit, but they threatened a lawsuit if this, if it ever got made into a movie that they were going to sue. And so the studio changed it, uh, said, you know, we're going to, we're going to make this a different character. And Kinsella was kind of irritated. He wanted them to, you know, hey, let him, let him sue. And there was also a rumor for a while that uh, J.D. Salinger was actually the author of Shoeless Joe, not W.P. Kinsella. And Kinsella oh never did anything to dissuade them from thinking that because he said, look, if people think that that Salinger is the one who wrote this, they're going to go out and buy more copies. And so let them think that. Yeah, but the, the speech that Terrence Mann, it comes, so much of it comes word for word from Kinsella. Um, there's a little bit that that uh, was reworked in the script from Phil Robinson. But when when Kinsella got the the version of the script, he said it brought tears to his eyes. 
And then when he watched it for the first time in April of, of 1989, he, he started crying again. He said it was so emotional watching what somebody did with his story, maintaining the integrity of the story, even though he realized some things were going to have to change. And, and I think that that was a, you know, a lot of times you go to a film and you see, it's like, boy, they really messed up that book. Um, they, Phil Robinson had to change a lot of the book, but he kept the, 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 you know, the sentimentality, the father son aspect. And, and even though some of it is cut and some of it was changed uh, from the book, it's still, it holds up and you can, you can see those two, you know, the film is a text and the novel is a text. You can see them on parallel tracks that they really uh, hold up quite well together. That, that's neat. And it's always an interesting sort of conversation to you have with the, as, as a reader, the movie version versus the, the book itself. So thank you for that. Yeah. But I don't know, is this the same question or a different question? Is uh, Who is your favorite author? My favorite author is Mark Twain. I mean, I, you know, I loved Kinsella's work, you know, and Kinsella's got a whole bunch of stories that aren't baseball related, you know, that he's, he called them his Indian stories, um, that they were, he, he got, you know, kind of railed against for cultural appropriation years later. And they're funny. But uh, yeah, Mark Twain. I I love Mark Twain. I I I think he is his humor holds up as well today as it did in in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. Um, so if I if I'm only allowed to pick one, I'm I'm picking Mark Twain. I think he's great. And you know, the nineteenth century novelists they seem to enjoy their sentence writing. You, yeah, you know, they just <laughs> took their time with the writing. I if I could transport myself to another time, it would be a, a time when stories were shared out loud. Yeah. Um, yeah. For their sound. Yeah. Well, and that's to me, the great thing about Twain, you know, he would he would write these, pay, you know, just volumes of pages during the day. And then at at dinner time after dinner, he would sit out on the front porch, you know, when he would go visit his uh, in-laws in Elmira, New York. He would sit out there and read pages of Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. And I think that there's that story connection, you know, the, the storytelling, the, the craft, if you've ever seen the the draft of Huckleberry Finn, you know, the words he changes and the things he moves around. He was meticulous with his, with his uh, craft. And, and I think that really comes across when you read his stuff. It's, it's terrific. And now I want to get back up to Hartford and go tour the house again. So that tour is, is great. And, and so whimsical. Um, and I think what also comes through in his writing is the tremendous compassion and love for humanity, you know? Oh uh, yeah. And, and yeah, as you said, the humor holds up. Did you yeah. have a particular favorite among his 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 canon? Sentimentally, I, Huckleberry Finn. I loved it when I was a kid because I liked the idea of going on a raft down the Mississippi River. My younger brother and I, Eddie, we used to you know uh, lay away. There was a, a audio book, like the books on record that we would listen to, and uh, Huckleberry Finn. And he and I were talking about that recently. Like, man, that was such a great story. But I think from his later stuff, uh, you know, Puddinghead Wilson is terrific. You know, again, you talk about, you know, he, his his commentary and his love for humanity. Some of his darker stuff, Letters from the Earth, is it ranks up there with Vonnegut, you know, as far as, you know, the, the satirical look at and kind of a dark look at, at what humanity can be. And yet there's this undercurrent of, yes, this is how we are now, but we don't have to stay there. We can be better. And I, I'm an optimist. I, I want to think we can be, no matter how bad the headlines might try to prove otherwise. I'm I'm enough of an optimist that where I think you know Twain kind of hit the nail on the head and said you know we're we're better we're we're still a good group of people overall. Right? Has he been the subject of your your research as well, or just very um, passionate? Um, yeah. So I, you know when I the the early part of my dissertation I had to do kind of an overview of baseball fiction and I mentioned stories like um, well you mentioned the Great Gatsby um, you know I mentioned um, uh, some of the old Ring Lardner stories and I mentioned. Um, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, where you know he has the Knights of the Round Table play baseball, um, and and Twain was a huge baseball fan. He he would show up and watch a team there in Hartford, um, and would you know kind of take note. He kept scorecards of the game, and he, I've never really done a whole lot with him. The the closest I came to writing about Twain was I was asked to throw a paper together about a month ahead of a conference where Hal Holbrook was going to be on the panel. And Holbrook played Twain for 60 some odd years. So the funny thing is I never presented the paper because Holbrook talked for so long that he ate up all of my time. 
cowboy. <laughs> which was wonderful because afterwards uh, there was a theater journal that had asked me if I would interview Hol Holbrook. And so the two of us got to sit down and have coffee for, I don't know, 35, 45 minutes. And I never presented that paper. Um, and he never knew he took my time. He, he didn't know who I was. And so I've never really spent a whole lot of time because so much has been written about Twain. You know, I don't feel as though I'm going to be able to bring anything new to the table uh, other than the fact that Hal Holbrook stole my time at a conference. Um, and that was OK. <laughs> I was OK with that. Oh, that's that's fun. It's and it's it's just so interesting how your your passion for baseball for Twain has taken you and and put you in the in the company of people who share your passion and um and and lead to great stories i mean these stories that you're telling right now are just are just awesome yeah there there are days sandy where i'll I'll be sitting somewhere doing some just really amazing thing i'm like, how did i end up here you know and again it, it goes i'm glad that i went to the go see that movie by myself all those years ago uh it 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 turned out pretty well and, and you know what when you were mentioning that before i was thinking that's a that's a pretty big deal uh a, a, a weekend day with, with your friends or whatever choosing to go your own road you know yeah. good for you I, I often wonder what would have happened had i gone to see indiana jones you know would i be writing about some artifact in ancient egypt or something? <laughs> i don't know i don't know i'm glad i didn't though <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious about your um nine a journal of baseball history and culture and the spring training conference can you talk a little bit about what those those are yeah, so we just uh, last year uh, celebrated our 30th year with the journal. Uh, Bill Kerwin, who taught up in uh, University of Calgary, um, started the journal, you know, more than 30, 30 years ago now. It was taken over uh, by Trey Strecker, and uh, Trey and I became friends. I started t attending the, uh, the Nine Conference, gosh, probably 15 years ago now. When Trey uh, had edited for about a decade, he was kind of finished with it and wanted to transfer it over. Uh, and so, again, it's one of those things I never planned it, uh, but because of some of the writing and the papers I'd presented over the years, uh, Trey thought that I was up to the task. And so I, I took over, I came on as co-editor for a couple of years, and then I took over as as the sole editor just about three years ago now. And um, we, we host a conference every year in Tempe, Arizona called the Nine Spring Training Conference. And it's a, it's a great way for some of the top uh, researchers and writers in the country to come together and talk baseball. I'm trying to make it sound really academic, but the, the, the real truth of the matter is we love to come together, uh, go watch a couple of spring training games, um, listen to each other, talk about baseball and present topics. And there have been a lot of really good uh, papers come from that and a lot of really good books uh, that have come from that. And, and I've made some some friends who have, you know, they'll be lifelong friends that, that it all started because of, of baseball. And so uh, the journal comes out twice a year. We have a spring issue and a fall issue. As its title says, it's a journal of baseball history and culture. And so we have papers, you know, articles about music and, and theater and the business aspect and the, the, you know, race, class, gender in baseball. And um, we also have a section of, uh, usually we have um, three or four poems, uh, different poets will submit some work. And uh, we've got a couple that I'm editing right now that um, are based on some statues at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so there's going to be a visual aspect with the poem side by side, which is kind of fun. But yeah, it's it, it's a lot of fun to work with. It, it's a lot of work, but again, it's the kind of work that you sometimes pinch yourself thinking, I I, I get to do this. Uh, it's not a, not a bad thing to have happen at all. No, and if any of our listeners are interested, would they just search up the journal and-, and Yeah, you can get on uh, nineconference.com, N-I-N-E conference.com. And uh, there's a link there to to the journal. Uh, there's a link to the uh, to the conference that we have. It's every year we award at the closing banquet, the uh, Society for American Baseball Research awards the Seymour Medal uh, to the best baseball book of the year. And uh, uh, we award that every year. Uh, and so it's it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to kick off baseball season because it's right at the start of spring training. And so it's kind of a, a good way to get all of us who have been, you know, uh, going into baseball withdrawals for the previous three months. It's a good way to kind of get that fixed leading into the, the regular season. I hear you. And just listening to you, Willie, I'm thinking there's got to be a like a the a baseball approach to academic style, what you were saying about why people go to the games and how people who go to the conference go to some games and, and hang out in a very relaxed way. It sounds like yeah. an academic style. That <laughs> well, it's 
Yeah, it's structured like an academic conference, but we have made it very clear. You know, you can tell the people who show up for the first time ever because they'll get up and present, you know, jacket and tie and are very formal. And and we try to tell them, don't ever do that again. Like, <laughs> you know, it's OK. You know, the, the next year they'll come back and they'll be up there in, you know, a Cubs jersey and a ball cap. And it's it's a really fun, laid back atmosphere. But the quality of scholarship we've had. I can think of uh, about a half a dozen of the Seymour award-winning books that are written by people who attend nine uh, on a regular basis. And some of those books actually started as conference presentations uh, for us. You know, we've had, um, oh gosh, um, Kurt Smith, who was George H.W. Bush's speechwriter. Uh, Kurt's written, you know, a dozen or more books on baseball, broadcasting, and journalism. Uh, he was the keynote speaker one year. Uh, one year we had Babe Ruth's daughter show up. She was in her 90s and she's showing up talking about the baseball tour that her uh, father went on and she got to go. She was in Japan with her dad in 1934, I think it was. And you're getting to hear this from it's she's talking about, well, daddy took us and I'm realizing, oh, she's talking about daddy. That's that's Babe Ruth, you know? Yeah. And wow. So, it's it's really you know we have some great keynote speakers we have some wonderful just people who drop in uh you know Felipe Alou who played in the major leagues and was the you know manager for the Expos and you know was you know major league coach for years and years uh he showed up one year it's it's just so much fun but it also i think helps show we have some uh undergraduate and graduate students who show up academia doesn't have to be stuffy right you know right. You, you can be the boring you know kind of stuffed shirt academic um, but I think that a lot of us at nine have been able to take our love for and passion for baseball and still have it be have some some rigorous academic, you know, uh, scholarship there. But it's fun. I mean, it's you know, it it really is a lot of fun. And and I hope that um, I, I think that that spills over into my classes when I teach where students can see that you can really have a passion for something that is is on the surface, not very academic. But then you start peeling the layers back. And you're able to see, oh, there's there's a lot more here than than just baseball. Well, it sounds exciting. And I, as you're speaking, I'm committing myself to um, <laughs> broadening my horizons and and stop seeing myself as a non baseball, non sports person, and maybe uh, dig a little deeper. You know, hey, come I, on out to nine some spring. We'd love to have you. Uh, it sounds like an adventure. Might just might just have to get to <laughs> the other side of the Hudson River, right? There's a vast yeah. universe. <laughs> well, and, and especially those up in the up in New England, they love coming to to Tempe, Arizona in March. You know, they leave and it's minus fifteen with you know eight feet of snow on the ground. They land and it's eighty five degrees and sunny. So there are worse places to spend early March for sure. I bet. Willie, would you share from your own writing so our listeners can get a sense of the the your style so we can um, kind of bring our conversation to a close there? Yeah. So when I was writing this book, Kinsella had had some health issues for years. And um, during the process of me writing this book, um, he fell ill. Um, he had been diabetic for years. He had all sorts of issues. And I called him one afternoon and his daughter answered and I said, hey, Aaron, this is this is Willie Steele, just, you know, calling to talk to your dad, had a few questions. And she said, well, dad was taken to the hospital in an ambulance today. So, I, you know, well, I'll get back with him whenever he's back. Well, I get a, a message a day or two later and she's she's writing this email. Her dad is talking to her and she's typing it out on her iPad. And he says, I'm not going to be leaving the hospital. He thought, you know, this is I can tell this is the end. Um, that previous, this was in September of 2016, and earlier that summer, uh, Canada had just passed the, you know, death with dignity, doctor assisted, so you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, Bill C-14. And so he knew that he was he was on his way out. And while all of that was going, you know, he he passed away in uh, on September 16th, and my own father died unexpectedly about uh, two months later. And so all oh, of this boy. was happening. And I will say that I'll tell you this story because I think Bill's kind of weird sense of humor would have appreciated this. When he died, his agent, who was my book agent at the time, um, was out of the country. And she said, um, I've given your name to your contact information to a few media outlets. And so you might get a phone call or two. What she didn't tell me is that she had sent out a press release with my information on it. So I was getting calls from... Oh. 
you know, Canadian, you know, CBC TV, drive, drive in, uh, drive home radio shows, uh, the Wall Street Journal. I mean, my phone was blowing up. And so I'm doing all that stuff that evening. And my daughter, who was eight at the time, came up and said, Daddy, I'm, I'm really sorry about your friend. And I said, well, honey, he was he was sick. He was old. And and, and but then and she says this with such a straight face, Sandy. She says, well, but now you know how your book is going to end. Oh, and. God. And I thought Bill Kinsella would have laughed, thought that was the funniest thing, but I realized that she was right. And so I, I sat down and, and really that night started writing what was going to become the last few uh, pages of, of, the, of the book. And so I'll, I'll just read a, a, a section, if you don't mind, from the last part. And this is entitled, uh, the, the, the chapter is called The Gin Runs Out. Um, Kinsella often said, there's, there's no problem leaving the party before the gin runs out. And so that's how he viewed the end of his life. And so this is from the biography that I wrote. The health issues he had tried for so long to keep at bay caught up to him early the following year. He no longer felt inclined to travel much, preferring instead to stay at home playing Scrabble on his iPad and watching Jeopardy. The essential W.P. Kinsella, the collection of his most popular works, was selling well and still garnering positive reviews. So he gave occasional interviews, but began declining requests for his time for book ideas or research projects related to his life and work. Over the preceding three seasons, the Chicago Cubs, a team that had not won a World Series since 1908, had developed into a serious threat. Though he had a deep appreciation for and understanding of baseball's history and tradition, having incorporated much of it into his fiction for many years, Bill was not one to grow sentimental about the Cubs making the 2016 playoffs, or perhaps even winning the World Series. In 2003, the last time the Cubs had made the playoffs, the Boston Red Sox were attempting to win their first championship in 85 years. Unmoved by the possibility of witnessing history that year, as both teams desperately fought to break their respective droughts, Bill admitted he was rooting against both teams, since they would be, quote, better as lovable losers. If they ever won, what would they have to look forward to, end quote. He was, however, intrigued as he watched Boston lose the opportunity to advance to the World Series when their manager made an ill-fated decision that cost him the American League pennant, as it so closely mirrored one of the most famous baseball pieces he had written many years before. Kinsella said, it's interesting that the scenario of my story, the last pennant before Armageddon, came to pass with Boston instead of the Cubs. When Grady Little, the manager, walked to the mound and left his tired ace in to lose rather than bringing in a reliever, it was life imitating art. As a side note before I continue, in that uh, short story, The Last Pennant Before Armageddon, there is a manager for the Chicago Cubs who's on a, a call and radio show, and there's a man who says, I have had a vision. And the vision is that the Chicago Cubs will win the last pennant before Armageddon. As the, as the summer drew to a close, it really looked more likely that the Cubs were going to win, uh, you know, make, make the postseason. And so uh, I, I closed the book with this. And again, as I mentioned, you know, Kinsella had gotten sick. He knew that he was dying. Uh, and he and I talked just a few weeks before he was in the hospital or before he went into the hospital. And I said, you know, the Cubs are playing really well and they might actually make it to the World Series. And in true Kinsella fashion, he said, they need to reissue my story. I can make a lot of money off of that. You know, <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. So, uh, so all of this is going on. This is the backdrop as, you know, as the baseball season is, is coming to a close and his life is coming to a close. He was talking with his friends and family, uh, the night before he died, his best friend, Maggie Harwood, or his, his uh, best friend's wife, uh, Maggie Harwood stayed with him. And she was reading his favorite book, Richard Brodigan's book, Watermelon Sugar, uh, one last time. And I closed the book with this. Like Brodigan, Bill Kinsella was opting to leave the world on his terms rather than letting things run their natural course. As they sat together talking through the memories, Bill often providing commentary on events and people he knew in his life, the discussion turned to his legacy. When Maggie asked what he'd like the world to hear as his epitaph, something perhaps to be noted on social media, he didn't, didn't hesitate. He quoted, as he often had in the past, a poet who wrote, when I'm dead, I hope it may be said, his sins were scarlet, but his books were red. On Friday, February 16th at 2016 at 12.05 p.m., 
Two weeks after he left the house for the last time, Bill Kinsella died peacefully, surrounded by his family, friends, and the necessary medical personnel just hours after the Cubs clinched the National League Central title. They secured a place in the playoffs. Seven weeks later, for the first time since 1908, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Oh, and I, wow. I, I added an epilogue later, but I, I thought that would, he could not have written that any better. You know, the, the parallel with his story and the end of his, it was just a really, uh, I think, a, a powerful way to end uh, that, that, that part of the book. Wow, that gave me the chills. <laughs> you know, it just sounds like this guy was such a character, you know. He really was. And I, I'll tell you, you know, when I said that, that he couldn't have written a better story, I got the chance when the Major League Baseball had a, a game, the first ever Major League Baseball game in Iowa. They, they built a field at the Field of Dreams movie site. And I got to watch that with my daughter and with Bill Kinsella's daughter. And that was really something special. When Kinsella, or when, I'm sorry, when Kevin Costner walked out of the cornfield, I mean, it's even now it's the hair on the back of my neck standing up and I look over and Kinsella's oldest daughter is tearing up. And, and at the end of the game, you know, if you watch the game, the, the Chicago White Sox came back to beat the Yankees with a home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. And somebody came down to Shannon Kinsella and said, your dad couldn't have written a better story. And it was just like waterworks. It was, it was great. Um, and I think that he would have been really proud of that as well. Amazing. You've just yeah. brought the, the game to life, the story to life. I am so grateful for your for your time today. And um, thank you. I find myself living in Tennessee. I'm going to have to take a class at, at Lipscomb University. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know? you're always welcome. Come on down. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today, Willie. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate it. <laughs>